You'll be hearing from our panel of experts and end with a few questions. So to begin, our panel list consists of, first off, Victoria Hathaway. She's the director of the Silver Group Division of the Bob Lucido team of Keller Williams Integrity. She's serving older adults when they are learning about downsizing, home selling, and relocating to easier lifestyles. She holds multiple certifications as an expert in working with seniors. Uh, she's the immediate past president of COGS, and she also serves as a board member of the Maryland Gerontological Association and advisory boards for Johns Hopkins University Aging Study and the National Association of Senior Advisors. Next up would be Bonnie Danker. She's the owner of Care Patrol Mid-Maryland. She's a certified senior advisor and a certified dementia practitioner. Bonnie consists, considers her ultimate calling to be helping seniors and their families navigate the oftentimes challenging process to find the best possible senior living scenarios. Bonnie went through the same daunting experience recently when she helped find care for a family member in Philadelphia. This experience gave her the passion that she has today to help families. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Vic. Okay, great. Thank you, Ophelia. It's great to be here. So when I talk about uh, researching the selling of your home, I'm taking sort of a 30,000-foot view uh, best practices approach. So if we go to our screen saying objectives, we're saying what are the best practices when selling your home? You know, there's a lot usually going on in an older adult sale of a home than just, you know, your move up, the, you know, we need another bedroom, we've had another child. So the opportunity to come as not the real estate agent in my role and to say, let's look at uh, what's going on here. You know, do we need to understand about power of attorney? Do we need to understand about Medicaid look back? Um, do we need to understand we have a house full of things that we're dealing with that haven't hurt anybody for the 30, 40, 50, 60 years that I've lived in my home? Um, understanding that there are apples and oranges in senior living and really kind of unpacking that and you know Bonnie's going to be tying into that in a great way um, as we go forward. Understanding the range of senior living options is something where I really feel that an expert is needed and although real estate licensees can get paid to guide older adults to senior living, uh, I actually frown on that practice. So that's my stance as a, as a real estate agent. Okay, great. How should I choose a, uh, a buyer's agent, listing agent? How do I pick my agent? So they're different. Uh, they're all licensed. They can all get the job done. They can help you buy your home. They can help you sell your home. Uh, I definitely advocate interviewing multiple agents if you have the time and the energy. Um, learn how to set the apple to the apple, if you will. And so when they come in and you're interviewing them, you know, one of the questions you can ask them is if they do more listing or more functioning as a buyer agent, because they're really two different things. Uh, some people wear both hats, but uh, you really want to get at that listing specialty because that's the person who's helping you understand how to um, prepare your home for sale and how to attract buyers, and it's just a whole different specialty of its own. Uh, understanding your listing contract is something about which I'm very passionate. Uh, when you, if you can take the time and bring in more than one agent, uh, this is a question you want to ask them, point blank, what is the length of your listing contract? Because broker by broker, it can vary greatly. And that is from a one-day cancellation length to 30, 60, 90, 120 days of length of contract. And so when you sign that, it is a bona fide contract, and that agent can hold you to it. Uh, so be sure that you have an awareness of that and put them on the spot. Commission rate is something I'm also passionate about educating on. Um, when agents come in, you know, commission is negotiable. And so they can sit down and start with, you know, sky's the limit. Um, but put them on the spot for what they charge uh, and then expect to um, ask them to unpack what they give for that commission because all commissions are negotiable and you get different things agent by agent. Uh, I like to give people a checklist. I love being able to kind of be an insider and say, all right, you know, interview us, grill us, and interview these other teams and firms and individuals as well. And I love for people to be empowered by knowing you know, how to put somebody on the spot. 
And I think later on we'll see the checklist you're referencing, yes. right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, what price should I sell my home for? Uh, this is something that, you know, if you have, if you open your home to an agent and you sit down and do this appointment, you should have this before they walk back out the door. I mean, at the very minimum, you don't want to have a time waster and somebody who's just there to market themselves. Make sure that you get that data from them. Uh, as we say in the, in the field, never use your tax assessment or Zillow or what you put into it or what you have to get out of it to determine your home's price because ultimately the market is going to be what the force that determines what price your home will sell for. Um, do expect a detailed market analysis from the agent about your home price. So once again, you know, the more agents you have troops through, uh, the more you're going to see that different individuals have different styles and different methods for when they sit down and present. But I will say that uh, you know, there is a great value to you in your research in having the agent who sits down and prepares actual data. And they're sitting down and they're showing you the, the market activity that's been going on up to three months back and ideally about one mile in radius from your home, which is similar to the way that an appraiser does it. Uh, you know, you may have an agent who comes in, looks around, you know, holds their finger up to the wind and says, I think your house is, is going to sell for X. Uh, okay, you know, very well. But I, I don't think that you as the consumer are well served by that. You really want to get at the data, make it concrete. Uh, then to understand your seller net price, um, this to me is something important because so many times when I'm helping, uh, people are trying to figure out what they have in their piggy bank, in their wallet, in order to be able to shop for senior living alternatives. So when you say, what is my home going to sell for, that is one important number. But have that agent sit down and do the arithmetic for you so that you get your seller net price. And that is going to be taking the price that conservatively you think that the home might sell for based on that market analysis. And then you're going to subtract, you know, transfer taxes, um, cost of selling. So specifically commission, uh, if you think you're going to need to pull down wallpaper or re-carpet, those kinds of things. Subtract all of that. And then you've got what you're actually going to have in your hot little hand when you walk away from your closing. Um, that really is a number that sort of trumps the importance of the home sale price. Oh, let's see, beware of agents that buy the listing. Okay, so now you're kind of in the weeds in an industrial sense in real estate. An agent who buys the listing is one who comes in and says, whether it's through data analysis or not, uh, this is what your home is probably going to sell for, and you don't even have to go live on the market. Uh, you know, we're going to sell it for this, and I've got your buyer. Okay. Some people think that that sounds great, and it, it can be a thing that works for people. You then don't have to have your home out in public. You don't have to have the sign on the lawn. You're not in the newspaper. You can keep it quiet from your neighbors. Um, you are not on the multiple list service. But what you run the risk of if you go this route is you may end up having that agent bring you a buyer for a price that ultimately is less than you would have, could have gotten had you marketed your home. So, you know, a $400,000 home might sell for $450,000. You know, you might get a bidding war. Uh, all those opportunities go by the wayside if you let that agent help set that price and not market your home. Also, people should understand that when that happens, the agent never had to go out of pocket to bear the expenses of marketing your home, but they're still going to make that commission and that commission on a lesser, you know, possibly lesser sale. So be, be aware of that. Uh, if you do go that route, understand it, you know, be able to ask all the questions and know that you're making an informed choice. Timing of the listing is important based on your needs. So again, you're looking for an agent who's really got the listening ear on and not trying to do a cookie cutter process to you. Um, sometimes people will take a year to get ready or longer. Sometimes people want to have the sign guy coming and putting the sign post in the lawn as the agent heads back out the door at the end of the appointment. I mean, it really is something that should be determined by you. Uh, real estate agents are famous for creating urgency. The sooner you sell their house, the sooner you, they get paid. Uh, but you really need to hold fast and make it be right for you. What does staging a house do for me? So staging is something that I feel is a very important topic when I'm working with my older adult clients. Um, staging didn't used to exist. 
staging is something that's new over the past, I would say, decade. And for all the uh, HGTV and all the internet technology and the function of photography in selling a house, it's all become part of this topic of, of staging. So staging a house means that you're making it the most visually appealing to a buyer by placing furniture, updating colors, decluttering the home, and other details. Uh, so you're, you're making your home look like a model home. You're making it look like the house that a buyer wants to come through and purchase. And when the real estate uh, agent sends the photographer, and let's hope that they actually have a bona fide photographer as opposed to an agent running around and snapping uh, pictures with their cell phone because that's a vastly different outcome. Uh, and you want it, to, those pictures are what are going to sell your house. And the reason why is if you go back you know, 20, 30 years, what you used to do is give your house a good cleaning and have the sign guy come and put it on the lawn. And then other real estate agents bring their shoppers to your house. The way that it works now is the home is readied. It looks the best it can be. The photographer comes. The pictures go up on the internet. And the home shoppers sit on their sofa on a Saturday afternoon with their laptop in their home, and they cruise through all the pictures of the houses that are up for sale. And they'll pick you know, the three or four or five that they're going to go out to and see based on how good those pictures look and, frankly, how little work there is when those houses are telling, the pictures are telling the story. So if they see you know, wallpaper and olive shag carpet and, and way out of date, they are, you know, you're running the risk that they're going to pass your house by. So when people then say, oh, but I'll give a credit, my advocacy to my clients is you may not even get asked to the dance. They might not even come to you and engage with you and visit and have the opportunity to learn that you might give a credit because they're just passing you by. So this is how technology and photography and the internet have really changed the game of selling a home and why staging for me encompasses all of these, these subtopics. Um, I will say that price is the cure. So if you choose not to stage or you are just, you know, you find it's overwhelming and you want to really truly go that as is route, that can be wonderful, but be sure that you have priced it accordingly because the, edu the shoppers are educated and they know what this is all about and they know how the price should agree with the pictures. Um, as a contrarian, I would also say that uh, vacant and empty can also work beautifully. Um, and in fact, it's often my favorite path for older adult sellers so that they don't have to go through all of the staging. Um, an example would be that you know, paint is refreshed, flooring is clean or refreshed, the, the shoppers can see the bones of the house, and I have seen it where their shoppers have narrowed it down to say four homes and they will actually pick the one of the four that is both vacant and empty because they know that then the timetable is such that they can put the offer in, close, move in and take possession, put the kids on the bus to school Monday morning and go to work because that house is, is you know, streamlined and clear to close. So, um, and then other topics that are so important, gosh, passionate about why is it important to have a power of attorney. When I show up and I've been brought in as somebody who works within real estate and I'm questioning people about estate planning and you know, specifically the topic of power of attorney, uh, I, I can get a look from that from the other side of the table. The reason that real estate can become obsessed with whether or not you have a power of attorney is that the agent puts the home up for sale, the home goes under contract, and then you've normally got four to five weeks to get to closing. And that's that timetable where things are going on behind the scenes as part of the sale process, your home inspection, your appraisal. And during that time, I have probably seen just about everything happen in, in that time gap between uh, contract and close. Car crashes, um, stroke, aneurysm, pneumonia, and it, if it renders you as the seller unable to physically sign at closing, then Houston, we've got a problem. We're not going to be able to sell your home and complete our task. So to come in and coach about the importance of power of attorney for this one function of, you know, you've hired us to sell your home and if we don't talk about this, I believe it's negligent on our part. Um, so that, that is something really super important and it isn't ageist. Really, I mean, from the time we're 18 and up, everybody ideally would have a power of attorney because, you know, anything can happen. 
So uh, please, please give that as something wonderful to do for yourself for homework. Your future self will thank you. And Vic, you brought up a wonderful topic that this is a topic that will be covered in one of our other sessions called Integrating Legal and Financial Planning. So fantastic. they can learn a little bit more about it if they tune into that session as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, one of our watchwords in real estate is, you know, you are touching on topics like um, legal, like financial, um, senior living, uh, estate selling of items in the home, financial and wealth management, and you know to be very circumspect about that and to say that when an agent's talking to you about that, they are none of those things, but they can kind of get you out of that 99 level up to maybe the 200 level and then give you some good resources and really get you going in the right direction to get these things taken care of when the time is right. So, and that's wonderful that you're ta uh, tackling that, Ophelia, thank you. Thanks, Vic. That was some great information. So I'm going to go ahead and transition over to Bonnie Danker. Bonnie, go ahead. Next up, what is the difference between independent living, assisted living, and nursing homes? Independent living comes in a variety of different options, including both apartments, townhouses, detached homes, and it encompasses both rental as well as purchase. So you may be working with a senior care advisor as well as a real estate agent when you're looking at independent living. Typically in independent living we see on the real estate side 55 plus or 62 plus specialty communities. And these communities may be independent homes, apartments, townhouses, detached homes. They usually will have an HOA with some planned community activities and minimal assistance with things like the maintenance, yard work, shoveling. Assisted living comes in a number of different varieties as well. Assisted living includes assistance with some or all activities of daily living. Assisted living, you're actually moving outside of what was your primary residence into a community or into a residential home. The activities of daily living come under the umbrella of things we do in our daily routine, walking, eating, dressing, bathing, toileting, and transferring. With an assisted living, it usually includes the dispensing of medication, preparing all of your meals and snacks, they would also manage laundry and provide activities for the residents of the community. Assisted living comes in both commercial or residential options, which is something that many people aren't aware of in the area. Um, within Howard County alone, we have over 65% of all assisted living comes in a residential option. So does that mean like it's a house like you and I live in and that just has been transformed to an assisted living? It's a great question, Ophelia. It does mean that. There are homes that are refabricated to be able to become handicapped accessible and serve the needs of older adults. Under this umbrella of housing options, we also have nursing homes. Nursing homes are long-term care for people who require around-the-clock care at a very high level of care what they would call skilled care. We'll touch more upon this a little bit further along in our discussion. Many care functions, however, that we think of that in the past may have been equated to only being found in nursing homes can also be done in the state of Maryland under their guidelines in assisted living. We're gonna go back and elaborate a little bit further on independent living. Within the independent living scenario, we have what's called life plan communities. In the past, we knew of these as continuing care retirement communities. Here in Howard County, we have Vantage House as well as Miller's Grant, which are continuing care retirement communities. As we get closer into Baltimore, we have a number of other communities and then going out through Carroll and Montgomery County as well. This type of living includes independent living, assisted living, and nursing care all on the same campus. It's what they would call a continual care community, meaning that you can go from one style of living to the next relatively seamlessly. 
there is a financial buy-in up front and you must qualify for a retirement community, a CCRC or life plan community, both financially and medically to move into the community. Usually, someone has to be able to function independently in order to be considered a good resident for a life plan community. But there are some exceptions to the rule based on census of the community. Sometimes they will allow someone to come in at that mid-level. There are 38 life plan communities in the state of Maryland. Falling a little bit further down under the independent living umbrella, we have the 55 plus or 62 plus independent living. These are independent living real estate communities or retirement communities that are either buy-in or rentals. And these communities vary greatly in size, the types of homes and the HOA programs. Many are year-long rentals or leases. Others are home ownership. There are also subsidized apartment communities in the county that fall under this umbrella of 62 plus independent living. And they're available for those who qualify financially. The pros of this type of living, the independent 55 plus 62 plus, is it can be very affordable. It's an easy out contract and there are handicap accessible apartments or cottages. The cons to this style of living is they don't offer any health care services, and that's really a big con because if someone is transitioning from maybe their the family home of years and years into the next step, many times they are going to need, 65% of us are going to need some type of health care services provided, and in the independent living arena, that's not part of the, the program. There's also financial considerations. Usually with the independent living that are rentals, there's a, it's a rental lease tenant agreement. Now we're going to touch upon assisted living. As we chatted about before, assisted living includes communities as well as residential homes where you would be moving out of your primary residence into a new community or into a new home. Assisted living allows people to be as independent as possible. You can come and go as you would like. While often they have a full program of activities that they have on site. They're also able to assist because they have 24 hour caregiving with activities of daily living, such as helping with walking or eating, preparing all your meals, if you need help with dressing or bathing or toileting, or you need your medication to be administered or set up for you, and also queuing. The communities vary greatly in size, care levels, and community feel and cost. In size, we have communities residential starting at two residents all the way up to 16, and with commercial communities, they'll start at 17 and they can go up to 300 and larger. With the commercial communities, you will also have apartment style living with kitchenettes. In residential communities or residential homes, the home has been retrofitted and your, and your accommodations are usually a private bedroom or a semi-private bedroom within the house. Some also have private baths attached. Within this style of assisted living, your common areas of the home are shared by the residents that live there. Most assisted livings in Maryland include all your meals, your snacks, laundry service, and light housekeeping. Larger communities can also offer pools, fitness centers, hair salon, transportation to shopping, planned activities, and many will also have a chapel and a movie theater. Within an assisted living, as a resident's level of care increases, they can age in place at the assisted living community, meaning that someone who comes in who may be relatively independent, one step away of living on their own, but might be looking for companionship and 24-hour supervision, can live in that community all the way up through end of life if they're licensed up through the higher level of care within the state guidelines. Assisted living differ differs from nursing home 
care in that they do not offer the higher level wound care. Many are not able to manage feeding tubes or tracheotomy care. But within their licensing level, many times they are able to care for your other needs. They would be the exceptions that might require you to move to a nursing home or skilled nursing center. Bonnie, can someone on hospice stay in an assisted living? Yes, certainly they can. Um, and many times they do. The idea of assisted living is that they would care for somebody through end of life. That is the ultimate goal um, in an assisted living. In an assisted living, if someone were to undergo hospice care, the primary caregivers of the assisted living would still be your primary caregivers. Hospice would come in as an overlay of care, over and above that care to help support the individual as well as the family that's under hospice. Thank you. You're welcome. Under the cons, um, the assisted living are private pay. Health insurance such as your Medicare does not pay for assisted living. And there's also no set standard for assisted living accommodations, such as has to have this size room, 12 by 14, or things like that. Um, within all communities, they do offer three meals a day, supervision, security, assistance with activities of daily living, and care levels that meet the requirements of, long, of what might be your long-term care insurance policy. Assisted living regulations. Assisted living are regulated by the state. The Department of Healthcare Quality is the agency that oversees assisted living. Each state has different rules as to what care can be accommodated in an assisted living versus a long-term care facility. The state surveys assisted living on a random basis, and you are entitled by law to see the most recent surveys of any community or residential home that you visit. The age-old question is paying for assisted living. How does this work? The national average for a one-bedroom part apartment in assisted living is $4,200 a month, but costs do vary greatly. Locally, here in Howard County, you have residential assisted living starting at about $2,000 a month, going up to about $6,000 a month for the high end for someone in a private room, maybe with a private bath, who is the higher level of care, to commercial communities starting at in the neighborhood of about $6,000 a month, going upward to $12,000 a month, again, based on the size of the accommodations one would select and the amount of care an individual would need. Most Assisted living is paid for with private funds. Individuals use things like long-term care insurance, social security, pension, and their assets in order to pay for their care. Long-term care insurance, if you have it, can cover some or all the costs depending on your policy. There are also some VA benefits, some veterans benefits for both the veteran and or their spouse that can help pay for assisted living. Some assisted livings also accept Medicaid waiver program or other county subsidies. Bonnie, I'd also like to add that the Office on Aging and Independence also has a couple different resources that the community can tap into in regards to, we have a long-term care ombudsman program where they are advocates for the residents in these types of settings that you're talking about. And what they can do is not only assist a client as to what are the kinds of concerns and complaints that they've dealt with with some of their homes, much like you mentioned the state survey, some of those documents are really hard to interpret and understand what they mean. So an ombudsman can talk to the family and or the individual that's considering this particular home and better understand what it means and how well this facility is doing or not doing according to the regulations. Um, another option is that we have a housing coordinator. He's the program manager over the subsidy program. Um, he has a team that goes out to all the smaller assisted living facilities in the county. You'd mentioned 16 beds or less or 16 beds or greater. And that's the dividing number where our program oversees the smaller assisted living facilities. 
um, and we work in tandem with the Office of Healthcare Quality, which is a regulatory agency. So again, another resource here within the Office on Aging, you can always contact them through our main number, 410-313-1234. Great. Okay. Thank you. Memory care. Under the umbrella of assisted living are communities that offer memory care. Memory care is assisted living that is specialized for care of people who have a diagnosis of dementia. Some larger communities are specifically designed for seniors with dementia, not only in terms of how their caregivers are trained, but also in how the space is laid out and designed. And so you will see some communities under that assisted living umbrella that are memory care specific. Some assisted living communities that are memory care specific also have additional supports in place to help the individual who has the memory loss be able to function at a higher level of, of um, quality of life. Important features of these specific types of um, subsets or communities are they have lots of exits to guard against wandering. Um, they also have found that creating routines that are scheduled and familiar to enhance memory will have the higher success for the quality of the day of the individual with dementia. There's activities and programs that are designed to enhance their memory. And they have secured indoor and outdoor area that give the residents the ability to move freely. And as we know, many people with dementia will may be still very active um, mobility-wise and physically. And so having the ability to be indoors and outdoors and enjoy that, that wider space area is very important. The pros of memory care specific communities is they have a higher staffing level for more attentive care. And this can be very important because many times someone with dementia really just needs someone to help cue or, or redirect them. They have the ability and want to have the, the ability to move around freely, but having that, that kind of eyes on them or that supportive care, someone who sees that they're having a, a you know, struggling is, is really important in, in them being able to get the care that they need. The, the con is that the memory care specific communities do tend to have a higher cost associated with them than regular assisted living. And again, that kind of circles back to the cost is higher many times because they're hiring more staff to be with the residents and to support them. Skilled nursing facilities um, and rehabilitation. Skilled nursing facilities, also known as nursing homes, um, are available and administered by professionals under the direction of, of a physician, whereas assisted living care is under the direction of a registered nurse, also called their delegating nurse. So that is really a prime difference between skilled nursing facilities, and that's where the word skilled comes in play, as opposed to assisted living. Many skilled nursing facilities also offer subacute rehab and other short-term care. In many skilled nursing facilities, you have long and short term, so to speak. On the short term rehab side is their subacute rehab, and individuals will come in there under their Medicare guidelines many times for that short term rehab inpatient care after any type of procedure. And then on the other part of the nursing home will be their long term care, and that will be where their residents that live there full term or full time are, um, are have their activities and programming. Some medical conditions do require the higher level of care best supported at, at nursing homes. We chatted a little bit earlier about things like tracheotomy care or a ventilator care, or if someone has high level of wound care requiring specialty wound care equipment, their needs are going to be best supported in a nursing home. Medicare, your health insurance, Medicaid is your long-term insurance for, excuse me, Medicaid and long-term insurance and private health insurance can pay for nursing home care, but you must medically qualify for a nursing home. 
Also, personal assets can be used to pay for your care when you need to supplement payment and you don't have to medically or financially qualify. The pros of skilled nursing facilities is that they're able to provide in-depth medical care in a setting less structured than a hospital. They can provide long-term care also for people with little income that need skilled level of care. The cons to some skilled nursing facilities is they, they provide limited socialization and it can feel like an institution. There can also be limited flexibility to come and go as you wish. Also, the cost of nursing home is significantly higher private pay than the cost of assisted living if you don't qualify for coverage. Here is a checklist that we referenced earlier, and the assisted living visit checklist will give you the, all the details that you want to think about and ask questions about should you go out to visit on your own. Please take a look at the Hiring a Realtor checklist. Uh, hold their feet to the fire, ask these questions. You're getting all the benefit of insider knowledge here to set the agents apple to apple. Excellent, ladies. Thank you so much. Um,